Well, thank you all for coming. My name is Rebecca Curry and I'm the Public Services Supervisor in ESU Special Collections and Archives, which is hosting our program tonight. I'm pleased now to introduce our speaker to you. He's Professor Emeritus of Classics at the University of Kansas, where I had the privilege of being his student. He's best known for his translations of Greek and Latin poetry, including Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, which was a New York Times notable book of the year. His other translations include the poems of Hesiod, Callimachus, and Sappho, Virgil's Aeneid, Ovid's Metamorphoses, the Odes of Horus, Statius Achilleid, Dante's Divine Comedy, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and the Bhagavad Gita. In 2010, he received the Umhofer Prize for his work as a translator. He maintains an interest in Asian philosophy and has co-authored a translation of Tao Te Ching and a Zen source book. And he is presently working on a collaborative translation of Nanus Dionysiaca. Please welcome Stanley Lombardo. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's, uh, it's good to see you again. I remember you well from our classes together. Uh, tonight I'll be reading uh, most of uh, book 23 uh, of the Odyssey. It's the uh, climax uh, of the poem. At the beginning of the Odyssey, uh, Odysseus has been gone from his home on Ithaca for 20 years. 10 years at the Trojan War, three years wandering, having various adventures, and seven years detained by the nymph Calypso on her island. When he finally returns uh, to Ithaca, disguised as an old beggar, he finds that his house has been besieged by scores of arrogant, violent young men who have tried to kill his son and are courting his wife, Penelope, who does not recognize or pretends she doesn't recognize or is not sure she recognizes her husband. With the help of Telemachus, a few faithful servants, and the goddess Athena, Odysseus kills all the suitors in a battle in his great hall. And now the dead bodies have been carried outside. The hall has been scrubbed clean and purified. And Odysseus, sitting by the fireside, has sent his old nurse upstairs to summon Penelope. The old woman laughed as she went upstairs to tell her mistress that her husband was home. She ran up the steps, lifting her knees high and bending over Penelope, she said, wake up, dear child, so you can see for yourself what you have yearned for day in and day out. Odysseus has come home after all this time and has killed those men who tried to marry you and who ravaged your house and bullied your son. And Penelope, alert now and wary, dear nurse, the gods have driven you crazy. The gods can make even the wise mad, just as they often make the foolish wise. Now they have wrecked your usually sound mind. Why do you mock me and my sorrowful heart wakening me from sleep to tell me this nonsense? In such a sweet sleep, it sealed my eyelids. I haven't slept like that since the day Odysseus left for Ilion, that accursed city. Now go back down to the hall. If any of the others had told me this and wakened me from sleep, I would have sent her back with something to be sorry about. You can thank your old age for this at least. And Eurycleia, the loyal nurse. I am not mocking you, child. 
Odysseus really is here. He's come home, just as I say. He's the stranger. They all insulted in the great hall. Telemachus has known all along, but had the self-control to hide his father's plans until he could pay the arrogant bastards back. Penelope felt a sudden pang of joy. She leapt from her bed and flung her arms around the old woman. And with tears in her eyes, she said to her, dear nurse, if it is true, if he really has come back to his house, tell me how he laid his hands on the shameless suitors, one man alone against all of that mob. Eurycleia answered her, I didn't see and didn't ask. I only heard the groaning of men being killed. We women sat in the far corner of our quarters trembling with the good solid doors bolted shut. So your son came from the hall to call me, Telemachus. His father had sent him to call me. And there he was, Odysseus, standing in a sea of dead bodies, all piled on top of each other on the hard packed floor. It would have warmed your heart to see him, spattered with blood and filth like a lion. And now the bodies are all gathered together at the gates and he is purifying the house with sulfur and has built a great fire and has sent me to call you. Come with me now so that both your hearts can be happy again. You have suffered so much, but now your long desire has been fulfilled. He has come himself alive to his own heart and has found you and his son in the hall. And as for the suitors who did him wrong, He's taken his revenge on every last man. And Penelope, ever cautious, dear nurse, don't gloat over them yet. You know how welcome the sight of him would be to us all, and especially to me and the son he and I bore. But this story can't be true, not the way you tell it. One of the immortals must have killed the suitors, angry at their arrogance and evil deeds. They respected no man, good or bad, so their blind folly has killed them. But Odysseus is lost, lost to us here, and gone forever. And Eurycleia, the faithful nurse, child, how can you say this? Your husband is here at his own fireside, and yet you are sure he will never come home. Always on guard. But here, something else, clear proof, the scar he got from the tusk of that boar. I noticed it when I was washing his feet and wanted to tell you, but he shrewdly clamped his hand on my mouth and wouldn't let me speak. Just come with me and I will stake my life on it. If I am lying, you can torture me to death. Still wary, Penelope replied, Dear nurse, it is hard for you to comprehend the ways of the eternal gods, wise as you are. Still, let us go to my son, so that I may see the suitors dead and the man who killed them. 
and Penelope descended the stairs, her heart in turmoil. Should she hold back and question her husband? Or should she go up to him, embrace him, and kiss his hands and head? She entered the hall, crossing the stone threshold, and sat opposite Odysseus in the firelight beside the farther wall. He sat by a column, looking down, waiting to see if his incomparable wife would say anything to him when she saw him. She sat a long time in silence, wondering. She would look at his face and see her husband, but then fail to know him in his dirty rags. Telemachus couldn't take it anymore. Mother, how can you be so hard holding back like that? Why don't you sit next to father, talk to him, ask him things? No other woman would have the heart to stand off from her husband who has come back after 20 hard years to his country and home. <laughs> but your heart is always colder than stone. And Penelope, cautious as ever, a child, I'm lost in wonder and unable to speak or ask a question or look him in the eyes. If he really is Odysseus, come home. The two of us will be sure of each other, very sure. There are secrets between us no one else knows. Odysseus, who had borne much, smiled, and his words flew to his son on wings. Telemachus, let your mother test me here in our hall. She will soon see more clearly. Now, because I'm dirty and wearing rags, she's not ready to acknowledge who I am. But you and I, have to devise a plan. When someone kills just one man, even a man who is few to avenge him, he goes into exile, leaving country and kin. Well, we have killed a city of young men, a flower of Ithaca. Think about that. And Telemachus, in his clear-headed way, well, you should think about it, Father. They say no man alive can match your cunning. We'll follow you for all we're worth, and I don't think we'll fail for lack of courage. And Odysseus, the master strategist, well, this is what I think we should do. First, bathe yourselves and put on clean tunics and tell the women to choose their clothes well. Then have the singer pick up his lyre and lead everyone in a lively dance to him, loud and clear. Anyone who hears the sound, a passerby or a neighbor, will think it's a wedding. And so word of the suitor's killing won't spread down through the town before we can reach a woodland farm. Once there, we'll see what kind of luck the Olympian gives us. They did as he said. The men bathed and put on tunics and the women dressed up. And the godlike singer, sweeping his hollow lyre, put a song in their hearts and made their feet move. And the great hall resounded under the tread of men and silken women dancing. And people outside would hear it and say, well, someone has finally married the queen, fickle woman couldn't bear to keep the house for her true husband until he came back. But they had no idea how things actually stood. Odysseus, meanwhile, was being bathed by the housekeeper, Eurynome. 
She rubbed him with olive oil and threw about him a beautiful cloak and tunic. And Athena shed beauty upon him and made him look taller and more muscled and made his hair tumble down his head like hyacinth flowers. <clears throat> Imagine a craftsman overlaying silver with pure gold. He has learned his art from Pallas Athena and Lord Hephaestus and creates works of breathtaking beauty. So Athena herself made Odysseus' head and shoulders shimmer with grace. He came from the bath like a god and sat down on the chair again opposite his wife, spoke to her and said, you're a mystery to me. The gods have given to you more than to any other woman an unyielding heart. No other woman would be able to endure standing off from her husband, come back after 20 hard years to his country and home. Nurse, make up a bed for me so I can lie down alone since her heart is a cold lump of iron. And Penelope, cautious and wary, I'm not being proud or scornful, nor am I bewildered, not at all. I know very well what you looked like when you left Ithaca on your long oared ship. Nurse, bring the bed out from the master bedroom, the bedstead he made himself, and spread it for him with fleeces and blankets and silky coverlets. She was testing her husband, Odysseus, who had borne much, could bear no more. And he cried out to his wife, my God, woman, now you've cut deep. Who moved my bed? It would be hard for anyone, no matter how skilled to move it, a God could come down and move it easily, but not a man alive however young and strong could ever pry it up. There's something telling about how that bed's built and no one else built it but me. There was an olive tree growing on the site. I built my bedroom around that tree. And when I had finished the masonry walls, done the roofing and set in the jointed close fitting doors, I lopped off all of the olive's branches, trimmed the trunk from the root on up, and rounded it and trimmed it with an adze until I had myself a bedpost. I bored it with an auger, and starting from this, I framed up the whole bed, inlaying it with gold and silver and ivory and stretching across it Ox hide thongs dyed purple. So there's our secret. But I do not know, woman, whether my bed is still firmly in place, or if some other man has cut through the olive's trunk. At this, Penelope finally let go. Odysseus had shown he knew their old secret. In tears, she ran straight to him, threw her arms around him, kissed his face, and said, don't be angry with me, Odysseus. You of all men know how the world goes. It is the gods who gave us sorrow, the gods who begrudged us a life together enjoying our youth and arriving side by side to the threshold of old age. 
don't hold it against me that when I first saw you, I didn't welcome you as I do now. My heart has been cold with fear that an imposter would come and deceive me. There are many who scheme for ill-gotten gains. Not even Helen, daughter of Zeus, would have slept with a foreigner had she known the Greeks would go to war to bring her back home. It was a god who drove her to that dreadful act or she never would have thought of what she did. The horror that brought suffering to us as well. But now, since you have shown, you know the secret of our marriage bed, which no one has ever seen. Only you and I and a single servant, Oct daughter, whom my father gave me before I ever came here, and who kept the doors of our bridal chamber. You have persuaded even my stubborn heart. This brought tears from deep within him, and as he wept, he clung to his beloved wife. Land is a welcome sight to men swimming for their lives after Poseidon has smashed their ship in heavy seas. Only a few of them escape and make it to shore. They come out of the gray water, crusted with brine, glad to be alive and set foot on dry land. So welcome a sight was her husband to her. She would not loosen her white arms from his neck, and rose-fingered dawn would have risen on their weeping had not Athena stepped in and held back the long night at the end of its course and stopped gold-stitched dawn at ocean shores from yoking the horses that bring light to men, Lampus and Phaethon, the colts, of dawn. Then Odysseus said to his wife, we have not yet come to the end of our trials. There is still a long hard task for me to complete. As the spirit of Tiresias foretold to me on the day I went down to the house of Hades to ask him about my companion's return and my own. But come to bed now, and we'll close our eyes in the pleasure of sleep. And Penelope calmly answered him, your bed is ready for you whenever you want it. Now that the gods have brought you home to your family and native land, but since you've brought it up, tell me about this trial. I'll learn about it soon enough, and it won't be any worse to hear it now. And Odysseus is mine, teeming. <laughs> you are a mystery to me. Why do you insist I tell you now? Well, here's the whole story. It's not a tale you will enjoy, and I have no joy in telling it. Tiresias told me that I must go to city after city carrying a broad-bladed oar until I come to men who know nothing of the sea, who eat their food unsalted and have never seen red proud ships of the oars that wing them along. And he told me that I would know I had found them when I met another traveler who thought the oar I was carrying was a winnowing fan. Then I must fix my oar in the earth and offer sacrifice to Lord Poseidon, a ram, a bull, and a board in its prime. Then at last, I am to come home and offer grand sacrifice to the immortal gods who hold high heaven to each in turn. And death shall come to me from the sea 
as gentle as this touch and take me off when I am worn out in sleek old age with my people prosperous around me. All this Theresia said would come true. And then Penelope, watching him, answered, if the gods are going to grant you a happy old age, there is hope your troubles will someday be over. While they spoke to one another, your enemy and the nurse made the bed by torchlight, spreading it with soft coverlets. Then the old nurse went to her room to lie down, and your enemy, who kept the bedroom, led the couple to their bed, lighting the way. When she had led them in, she withdrew, and they went to their bed and to their rituals of old. Telemachus and his men stopped dancing, stopped the women's dance, and lay down to sleep in the shadowy halls. After Odysseus and Penelope had made sweet love, they took turns telling stories to each other. She told him all that she had to endure as the fair lady in the palace, looking upon the loathsome throng of suitors who used her as an excuse to kill many cattle, whole flocks of sheep, and to empty the cellar of much of its wine. Odysseus told her of all the suffering he had brought upon others and of all the pain he endured himself. She loved listening to him and did not fall asleep until he had told the whole tale. He began with how he overcame the Cyclones and then came to the land of the Lotus Eaters and all that the Cyclops did and how he paid him back for eating his comrades and how he came to Elis who welcomed him and sent him on his way. But since it was not his destiny to return home then, the storm winds grabbed him and swept him off, groaning deeply over the teeming salt water. Then he came to the Lystragonians, who destroyed his ships and all of their crews, leaving him with only one black tarred hull. Then all of Circe's tricks and wiles, and how he sailed to the dank house of Hades to consult the spirit of Theban Tiresias and saw his old comrades there and his aged mother who nursed him as a child and how he heard the siren's eternal song and came to the clashing rocks and dread Charybdis and Scylla whom no man had ever escaped before and how his crew killed the cattle of the sun and how Zeus, the high lord of thunder, slivered his ship with lightning, and all his men went down, and he alone survived. And he told her how he came to Ogygia, the island of the nymph Calypso, who kept him there in her scalloped caves, yearning for him to be her husband, and how she took care of him, and promised to make him immortal and ageless all his days, but did not persuade the heart in his breast. Then how he crawled out of the sea in Phaeacian, and how the Phaeacians honored him like a god and sent him on a ship to his own native land with gifts of bronze and clothing and gold. He told the story all the way through, and then sleep, which slackens our bodies, fell upon him and released him from care. Thank you very much for listening.
We have about 20 minutes left. Uh, are there any questions? So yes, we have now come to our Q&A segment. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question, they can do that by visiting emporia.edu slash live. Um, if you go to the Special Collections and Archives section there, you'll see a link to a submission form. And actually, um, while we give everyone some time to find that link, I have a question that I'd like to ask. Mm. So I know that it has been some time now since you completed your translation of the Odyssey. I believe it was first published in the year 2000. I'm wondering as you've continued to revisit it over the years and continue to present it to audiences, if any new resonances have developed for you that weren't present initially? Resonances. Well, when you know, I translated it yeah, 20 years ago, so long Odysseus was away from home. Um, so I've had time to live with it. My main concern back then was to hear Homer's voice in the Greek text, and to somehow hear it as my own voice, crafting American English poetry uh, to translate. I've done the same thing with the Iliad a few years uh, before. So hearing his voice has always been paramount uh, to me. And we used to, uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, read Homer uh, out loud uh, every day at noon. Uh, we did that for over a semester, and we did the Iliad too. We read it out loud. And it was with a master reader, Gareth Morgan, a Welshman who read as if he were Dylan Thomas and Richard Burton combined. Uh, and that gave me you know, some grounding in what this really sounded like how it really was a performance piece and uh, not simply a text. So that's what mostly preoccupied me uh, when I was translating it. Um, and, you know, I would actually translate some of it and try to find some kind of audience and try to do a performance. And then, of course, after it was done, I performed either the Iliad or the Odyssey um, over a hundred times. Uh, for audiences um, all over. Um, and so I feel that I've maybe repaid my old death to, Gar to Gareth Morgan. Um, and living with the poem that way, I really did live with it. It's not like I translated it 20 years ago and said, well, that's that, uh, you know. I've been more and more struck by the, the spiritual quality of the text. Um, to put it in maybe scholarly terms, the Odyssey is all about a homecoming. Odysseus coming home. And the Greek word for that, which occurs in the fourth line of the poem, is nostos, which means return home. And Odysseus does this primarily by virtue of his noos, his mind, which occurs in the third line of the poem. Uh, it was, in, I forget when, but Douglas Frame, a great scholar, showed convincingly that both nostos and noos come from the same root, a root um, uh, nos, uh, which means to return from darkness to light. The Iliad and the Odyssey are both uh, shot through uh, with light. Uh -huh. And Homer's mind, I think, was shot through with light. Now, he was blind, but he had an inward light. Uh, Jacques Lucerne uh, was blind, and he wrote about being he was blind from, from birth. Uh, he said, although he was blind, he had a feel for the world as being bathed in light and everything came alive to him in that way. And I think Homer, the blind poet, 
you know, was, was something like that. So I began, you know, looking uh, at, at the poem um, almost in terms of a Zen koan. Um, you know, a koan is a, a very, very brief story, actually, um, which uh, Zen teachers uh, use as a text uh, upon which to base uh, questions for the student. So, for instance, in this section I just read that you just heard, the Odysseus mind and Penelope's mind are finally coming together. And that's a very beautiful thing when two minds meet and come together. And when our minds meet Homer's mind, um, due to our, our attentive reading and due mostly to the the genius that inspired it. So if I do, had to make up a koan question based on so this book, it would be Odysseus' mind and Penelope's mind. Are they the same or different? You can't say same, you can't say different, or you can't say both. What can you say? So that's how I'm feeling the poem now. It's not opposed to how I was feeling it 20 years ago, but there's been a development, I think. So thank you for, for your question. Of course. So we do um, have a question now from an audience member. So Sherry asks, she says that I recently read This Tender Land by William Kent Kruger, which was inspired in part by the Odyssey. Are there other popular works based on Homer's poem that you would recommend? Well, yes. Um, there is a long sequel tradition to Homer, and I will uh, talk about those uh, briefly. Uh, Dante is the first in this uh, sequel uh, tradition. You know, uh, Ulysses, he uses, of course, the Roman uh, spelling. Um, is encountered uh, by Dante in, uh, what is it, Canto 26, um, and, you know, tells uh, the story of his last voyage. Um, then uh, Tennyson, you know, has the poem Ulysses, which you're probably all uh, familiar with. Not as uh, familiar as Giovanni Pasquale uh, in the 19th a century who uh, his poem uh, starts with Odysseus at home and he's really bored and he looks at Penelope he doesn't see anything in her that would make him stay I don't think we get that impression from Homer but he has Odysseus sail again and revisit uh, the sites of his adventures and they're all desolate and empty full of bones so it's uh, a little bit of an existentialist dismal existentialist take on the Odyssey. But um, the largest and most impressive uh, sequel is uh, Nikos uh, Kazantzakis, whose um, poem, The Odyssey, a modern sequel, composed in modern Greek, and uh, pushing 40,000 lines, so um, considerably longer than the Iliad and the Odyssey put together, uh, begins, well, again, with Odysseus at home, and he soon gathers some companions, as, as in Pascali, and as he threatens to do in, in Tennyson, um, and as he does, of course, in Dante, in Dante, he sails away and comes into the South Atlantic, and he sees Mount Purgatory looming in the distance. Purgatory is an island mountain in the Southern Hemisphere in uh, Dante, and a whirlwind comes out, he sees something mortals aren't supposed to see and destroys them. But Kazantzakis takes him all over, um, tries to recruit Helen, uh, is down in Crete, visit Diomedes, uh, goes down to Egypt, uh, founds uh, you know, an ideal city, which is destroyed by an earthquake on uh, its inaugural day, and then becomes a uh, Christ-like figure, tromping down through the whole continent of Africa, down to Cape Horn, uh, where he boards his last ship, uh, the ship of death, 
uh, and his soul leaps to the peak of its holy freedom and it becomes one with the cosmos. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful read. It's been brilliantly uh, translated uh, by Kim and Fryer. I, I really recommend it. And uh, each book has a nice little summary so you can skip around if you want. Um, read the beginning, the part uh, with Helen and Egypt, the ones I just mentioned are easy to find. So those are books you know, inspired uh, by, or uh, parts of books anyway, inspired uh, by, Don, uh, by, by Homer. <clears throat> uh, maybe we have time for one more, I don't know. Uh, we don't actually have any further questions, but we have a comment from an audience member named Paul who simply says, bravo. Well, thank you. A sentiment which I also echo. Well, I appreciate it. And it's as well that we're ending early. There's a debate that most of us are probably going to tune in. I want to thank you again. Uh, I wish I could have come to Emporia uh, in person. That was the original plan. Um, but it's, uh, it's good to be with you all uh, virtually. And um, uh, maybe we'll meet again in 500 years. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>